Welcome to Calvary Conversations. My name is Mariah, and I'm here with my dad, Pastor Craig Roders. Hey. Today we have two very special guests with us in studio, so I'm going to introduce them. First, we have Laura Pedersen, and Hello. she is with 40 Days for Life. So, Laura, can you share a little bit of who you are and why are you here? <laughs> well, uh, I'm here because you asked me to be here. Yes. Um, I am a registered nurse, um, primarily in obstetrics, and um, just felt compelled to start getting involved in the pro-life ministry. And um, I've worked in with pregnant teenagers for 21 years, supporting them in our Tucson community to help them have healthy outcomes. Mm -hmm. And a couple of years ago, I was severely convicted to get mm -hmm. um, to jump all in with the pro-life movement mm -hmm. and taking the lead on the 40 Days for Life campaigns and generating interest and getting people to the sidewalk to pray to end abortion Amen. is definitely where my passion has gone. Amen. And Great. we're thankful for you just even being part of our family, Calvary Valley and our church family. So um, we also have another guest with us who just spoke with us on Sunday, Seth Gruber, Ooh. and we are thankful you're here. So Seth, can you just share for the listeners who don't know you, who you are and what you do? Yeah, no, it's it's really good to be with you guys. It's fun to have these conversations, mm -hmm. you know, with like-minded people mm -hmm. yeah. and to to gather together. I mean, Amen. you know, Hebrew says to not forsake meeting together, yeah. as some are in the habit of doing. And I think in the last 12 months, more people got in the habit of not meeting together yeah. Yeah. than maybe any other time in American history. Yeah. And uh, that failure to to heed the that warning in Hebrews has has you know led to a lot of damage, yeah. mm -hmm. and that's certainly true on the issue of abortion, which mm -hmm. is sort of my lane. Because mm -hmm. uh, if the church can't even bother to gather together, can't even mm -hmm. bother to get off the couch mm -hmm. and stop live stream worshiping, yeah. yeah, and gather with embodied and sold individuals together, how in the world could they rally together? to get outside in the hot sun outside of abortion clinics and plead for the life of the orphan. Yeah. So we've embraced a very comfortable cush um, Christianity, which Bonhoeffer might call cheap grace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, right? He said cheap, uh, cheap grace is grace without discipleship, mm -hmm. grace without confession, grace without absolution, grace without Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. In short, it's a, it's a Christ created in your own image. Yeah. Yeah. And so all of that to say, it's awesome to, to <laughs> gather together with, with believers um, who, who see the same truth, right? Yeah. I mean, that's what C.S. Lewis said friendship was. Yeah. And two friends see the same truth and yeah. kind of say amen together and delight in those yeah. truths. And, and what truth is more beautiful or great than the prenatal God mm -hmm. who entered human history in a womb that he once knit together yep. and takes on fetal flesh. So when Christ says he identifies with us, we do not have a high priest who cannot yeah. sympathize with our weaknesses, but was tested in every way that we were yet without sin. Well, that, that God identified with us from the prenatal stage. Yeah. Yeah. He became a zygote, an embryo, a fetus, therefore declaring forever that life is sacred in the womb. And so that's why I care about the life issue. Yeah. <laughs> I care about it because these are image bearers of God. And they dwell in a location that we safely dwelt, at least mm -hmm. most of us. Now, yeah. uh, a woman who was here this morning after I preached is actually an abortion survivor. Mm. And, and she came by today and she works with the Abortion Survivors Network, oh, uh, my friend Melissa Odin's ministry. Mm. Oh. And Melissa Odin survived a saline abortion wow. in wow. the 70s um, and was essentially... Um, burned in the womb because wow. saline is the salt yeah. solution yeah. that would burn babies. It's, they don't, it's illegal now to do saline salt abortions, but she survived that abortion over a five day period wow. and was born alive and survived wow. and wow. found out later that she was an abortion survivor as a teenager from her adopted parents and now connects abortion survivors all around the country. Wow. Um, but f with the exception of the abortion survivors in our midst, and there's actually a lot more than yeah. you know, yeah. um, all of us dwelled safely in these wombs yeah. and mm -hmm. we, so I, I, you know, we have what I like to call born privilege, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. we talk about white privilege, right? Yeah, like privilege. systems of oppression. <laughs> and you're participating Craig in a system of oppression. <laughs> yeah. Wait, yeah. Wh wh what are you talking about Seth? I, I, I'm not racist. I have <laughs> black friends. I, I mean, I love, I love <laughs> God's creation regardless of their, no, no Craig, you <laughs> participate in systems of oppression <laughs> simply because of your skin color. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I find that so hilarious and we don't have time to jump into everything that's yeah. wrong with critical race theory. But um, I just find that so funny because the very people who say that participate in the system of oppression called abortion. Yep. You want to talk about systemic injustice? All right, let's talk about systemic injustice. The only form of systemic injustice today is abortion mm -hmm. yeah. because it 
literally denies natural rights mm -hmm. to an entire subset of the human species yeah. because they differ from the elite class who has mm -hmm. a vested interest in dehumanizing and murdering them. Well, I mean, that's systemic yeah. oppression. Well, so you have born privilege yeah. if you're pro-life or pro-choice because your mother didn't kill you yeah. and yet you can't even bother to speak out against babies who are being killed in the womb. Mm. And so that's what's going on in the country right now. Uh, and, and I think many churches are starting to wake up to that reality. Mm. And yeah. so that's my heart. So I speak to churches, schools, um, youth groups, pregnancy center banquets, conferences all around the country to bring moral, spiritual, political clarity to these issues, to clarify it in the minds of Americans. And listen, words, 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 all that's important. At the end of the day, I just use words to point people back to reality, to try to bring clarity to seemingly complex debates yeah. so that it demands action. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to be one of those public speakers that just like has a lot of cool crap to say. <laughs> and because I can, I can talk about a lot of stuff and sound really cool, yeah. you should pay me money to speak. I don't want to yeah. be that person. I want to be someone who brings clarity through words Amen. because reality tends to be self-evident. Mm. Yep. That's why our founder said, we hold exactly. these truths to, to be, be self-evident self that Amen. all men are created equal and they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And of course, our constitution would say in property. Mm. Well, you know, if you don't get the right to life right, you won't get any other rights None. right. And no. those should be self-evident yeah. because your mother didn't abort you, pro-choicer. And I'm glad you're here. Yeah. The right to life should be self-evident, but it's not. Yeah. And that's because of decades of pro-choice propaganda, largely in our educational system, sometimes yeah. from American pulpits, mm. that is, uh, that is, propagandizing the next generation with a certain vision of the good life. And for mm. them, that good life must entail the right to kill their own preborn children wow. so you can pursue your quality of yeah. life. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we, we prefer quality of life outside the womb mm. over protection of life in the womb. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have protection of life in the womb, you'll never have quality exactly. of life exactly. outside the womb. Yep. And yep. I think those things are self-evident, but that's because this is what God's called me to. This is all I speak about. For a lot of people, <laughs> that is not self-evident. Mm -hmm. So bringing that clarity to people because confusion leads to apathy. Mm -hmm. mm. If something is not yeah. clear in your mind and you're like, I'm really confused by the issue, yeah. even pro-lifers who come up to me and they say, I'm pro-life, but what about rape? What about life of the mother? What about the first trimester when it's not as human? Like they don't have the same clarity. So if you're confused, it leads to apathy. Mm -hmm. But but moral clarity demands responsibility. Mm, yeah. And at the end of the day, that's that's all I try to do. Yeah. So I, I'm grateful for you, Pastor yeah. Craig, and, and your leadership and team here to say, you know, we're going to fight on the front lines um, for these children who are more vulnerable and defenseless yeah. than any other victim. Amen. And there Amen. are a lot of victims, yeah. but none more so than the preborn. Amen. And I love that. Like you were talking this morning and if you guys haven't seen it, you can go back on our YouTube and watch that. Uh, we, a lot of times we are apathetic, a lot of the church and stuff, because like you said, they think, Oh, I don't know enough in that, which is an excuse. You could just read your Bible and you should know. But I love how you Amen. said, we can't just have confession. We need to prove it with resistance and action. So Laura, you had some questions, so we'll just throw questions at you, Seth, and you can answer them. But one of them was talking about the sidewalk and a lot of people are confused. Like, what does that look like? What do I do? Cause they hear, that they can do things, but they don't know how that would fit in their, right. what you say, their cush lives. And so yeah. mm. we're trying to push all of us, like what you did this morning, firing us up. Yeah. But we don't want to just, like we always say, we don't want to just have like a revival, a woo -woo, like exciting meeting. <laughs> and then like, what were we excited yeah. about? What do we do? Yeah. Like we need the Action. practical stuff. So Laura, do you want to read yeah, that question? Good. And then. So um, I'm just, obviously as somebody who is the 40 days for life campaign mm -hmm. which is going to the sidewalk to pray to end abortion um i'm just curious what your thoughts were in related to people um, who are outside the abortion clinic whether they're praying and holding doing the peaceful prayer visual which is what right. 40 days for life is about versus those that may have those graphic signs of aborted fetuses mm. um and you know that they might be more vocal about what's going on at the sidewalk um because there's a lot of negativity related to people being at the sidewalk. I used to be one of those people, mm -hmm. you right. know, being like, oh, they're wasting their time holding mm -hmm. up their signs or standing out mm -hmm. there saying they're praying. Um, but, you know, is there a place for both or is there a different place that yeah. some of those things can be 
can be mm-hmm. happening that would yeah. be more impactful? Yeah, good question. Well, I, I certainly won't claim to speak for the pro-life movement mm-hmm. because there's a lot of disagreement in the pro-life mm-hmm. movement on mm-hmm. the question you just asked. Mm-hmm. In fact, I would go so far as to say more people in the pro-life movement are opposed to holding graphic abortion signs mm. outside of pregnancy, uh, outside of abortion clinics, then are in support of doing that. Mm. So I'm on the other side, and here's why. Because many men and women who are seeking an abortion have really hardened their hearts mm. towards the life of the child in their womb. Mm. Because here's why reality tends to be self-evident. So if you grant the reality that 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 conscious, that conscious, Mm -hmm. that small voice in your head is saying, this is a baby. If you if you give credence to that voice, it demands responsibility. It causes conviction. So you have to deny that voice. You have to suppress it in order to tell yourself, Mm -hmm. no, it's it's okay. It's actually okay that I'm getting an abortion because it's an Maybe it's a necessary evil. I already have a few kids that are born that Mm -hmm. I'm not going to kill, so I'll just kill the youngest sibling, Mm -hmm. and I'll convince myself that that's required in order to care for my children that I didn't kill. Right? They tell themselves that, um, and so they suppress reality. And largely, this has been what the left has done for decades, is is they just stick their heads fully in the sand and deny the existence of an external reality. Um, and And that's why the underlying worldview assumption of secular liberalism is relativism, the, yeah. the belief that there is no objective truth or standard we're all mm-hmm. beholden to. We invent our own truth. Mm-hmm. Uh, so how dare you tell me not to kill the preborn child because I've defined them out of existence because mm-hmm. that's my truth, right? Yeah. So, so all that to say, many men and women who walk into abortion centers have hardened their hearts mm-hmm. yeah. towards the preborn. Now, many of them are scared and freaked out, which yeah. means they're more likely to accept the help of Christians. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But there is a, a significant number of guys who walk into these killing centers who wa- they're going to walk right by those pro-lifers outside on the sidewalk and they yeah. don't want to hear anything from them Same. because they, they're like, no, I, I have to get this abortion. I cannot have mm-hmm. this child. Mm-hmm. So is prenatal imagery going to reach that woman? Mm-hmm. Maybe. Is a sign that says it's a baby going to reach that woman? Maybe. Mm-hmm. I'm support of all of that, by the way. Yeah. I'm not saying we shouldn't do any of that. Amen. Go for it. But hasn't the stats say like the sonograms has really helped? Totally, because it humanizes a child. Here's the thing, though. Some men and women are so hard-hearted that nothing short Mm. of a picture that shows them what they're about to do Mm. to their child will suffice to change their mind. Yeah. Well, so the, like, the video you showed, really, yeah. I mean, I brought a tear to my eye. I think I heard a lot of people yeah, crying. Yeah. So, I mean, we need to say, and I think someone once brought a, a baby to the Congress or Senate, I don't know what, and they got in trouble huge because no one wanted to see it. Wow. But, you know, we that imagery, when you yeah. see those little hands, and I mean, I think hopefully we can show that video on here. But it's like, it's just, that grips me because it's so easy. Like you said, when it's hidden in the womb, yeah. you kind of can easily yeah. forget That's about nice. it when you see what you're doing. And right. you, you remember the, I'm old school, so I'm old. So I remember the silent scream when you see yeah. the saline and you see that babies, you yeah, definitely exactly. can see it freaking out. Because it pain. forces us to, to, to confront reality. Yeah. And that's why it's important. So again, that's a position that, um, that many people in the pro-life movement would start screaming at me for defending because mm. they say you're going to shame and condemn the woman, right? And you're going to scare mm. her away. 
but my position is I support all of those images. I support yeah. prenatal sonogram images. I support yeah. embryoscopy images. I support words that just say it's a baby. We love you. We're here to help you. And I support graphic abortion imagery yeah. mm-hmm. because I think that that each of those images and, and approaches will minister to and reach a certain woman who maybe couldn't have been reached without that type of mm-hmm. imagery. Mm-hmm. And for those who are so mm-hmm. hard-hearted, then we also need to have that abortion imagery to scare them to not do what they're about to do. But I would never defend, and I don't, individuals who hold aborted baby photos and then they yell and scream, you're a murderer and God hates you. Um, I mean, yeah, exactly. That's, I mean, well, one, it's sin. It's sin to to yell at people like that and to treat them Mm -hmm. uh, uh, because that's not loving, right? Um, you, You can, you can, you can scream truthful things like abortion is murder, but you can do it in a way that's not helpful. But then if you're screaming, God hates you and you're a murderer, <laughs> well, that, 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 that is neither yeah. loving nor truthful Amen. because God doesn't hate them. them right? God yeah. doesn't hate them. And they're not a murderer yet. Yeah. Yeah. Not yet at yeah, least. Yeah, exactly. and, and of course the abortionist is the murderer. The parents are accomplices. Mm-hmm. Right? They paid the physician to kill their child. So that would be my answer. I think, I think we should hold all of them out there. But here's the thing. If someone was like, I don't know if I can do the abortion imagery, right? Uh, I'd be like, okay, I'm not going to force you to, but don't tell others that they're wrong if they have the courage to hold abortion imagery because that might reach a woman who otherwise wouldn't be reached. Amen. Yeah, because the silent scream thing, you know, that was a long time ago when that came out. And it really touched me to see that mm-hmm. video footage of a baby yeah. running, yeah. you know, getting away. And Bernard from Nathanson was behind yeah. that, who yeah. was the one of the most prolific abortion killers in the country. Oh wow! And has know. killed tens of thousands of children through wow. abortion, including his own daughter. Mm. Oh, he he killed his own daughter through abortion, mm. an abortion he mm. performed on his daughter and his wife, wow. and or a girlfriend. I can't recall if it was mm. his wife at the time. And he was instrumental in getting, um, in preventing pro-life laws from getting passed and from eventually securing Roe versus Wade. Mm. So Bernard Nathanson was performing illegal abortions before 1973, Mm. before abortion was legalized, along with Larry Later and um, the, um, the author of The Feminist Mystique, who was behind the mm. women's movement in the 60s and 70s, whose name I just blanked on. Um, and that that's the story behind how we got abortion in America, mm. is mm. that the abortion movement co-opted the women's movement to become mm. one and the same, yeah. because the abortion rights movement pre row understood that they couldn't secure legal abortion without the help of the women's movement, Mm. Mm -hmm. which at the time, if you're aware of, was not pro-abortion. The women's movement was about equal voting rights, right? Workplace treatment, (laughs) right? I mean, yeah, initially the women's movement was not like this crazy second or third wave feminism. It was just, it was just Mm. like basic first wave feminism, which no one has a problem with. It's just like equality before the law. And that's what they were seeking. But then the, the abortion rights movement, uh, be, like really pressured the women's movement to adopt abortion as part of their platform. Mm. Mm. So when those movements became one and the same, that be, that's a, ultimately how they they pressured the Supreme Court into passing that. And if you guys want to learn more about that story and your listeners, you got to check out the new Roe versus Wade mm. movie, which mm. just oh, yeah, came out and it tells the story about seen? how Bernard Nathanson and Larry Later and all of these activists in the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s, um, organized a political campaign in order to pass abortion laws and oh. to, to mm. secure Roe versus Wade. And it's a pretty disturbing story when you, when you learn mm. about, about it. I mean, some of the Supreme Court justices at the time, two of them had family members who were volunteering for Planned Parenthood. Mm. Oh, wow. So you had a huge conflict of interest yeah, yeah. at the Supreme Court level. Oh. Uh, and, and anyway, so if you guys mm. want to learn more about that, yeah. it's yeah. a pretty damning yeah. story. And, and it just goes to show how dehumanizing that movement has always been. Yeah. yeah. And I agree with you on the, the part of like, if someone feels convicted, like this is the way that they should approach it. That like you were talking about James, what you know what to do and don't do it. It's into you. Like me, I, my flesh tends to be like an extremist. Like I go really intense, but I need to be led by the Holy Spirit. But other people are a little bit maybe more afraid, which I fear, man, like, don't get me wrong. I do. And that's the big thing I struggle with. But I think me and my dad are the same way. Like we use intense words and things. And the sad thing is a lot of times people are so offended and they don't like that. But I like how you said it is like, first of all, like what a lot of us 
don't realize is that we've been so desensitized. Like when we see that, most kids, they see that and it doesn't affect them because they play video games and they see right. all this stuff. And so it makes me sad because only the Holy Spirit can convict mm -hmm. and do that. But a lot of times when we're talking even about the fear of God, people just think the fear of God is, oh, I love God so much, which is true. It's true. We love God so much. We don't want to hurt his heart. But for me as a kid, it wasn't like, oh, I'm just going to not disobey my mommy and daddy because I love them so much. No, it was because I was scared and I didn't want to get in trouble. Like I didn't want to get a spanking. Like that's how totally. they instilled fear into me. But then it ended up turning into love because I realized, oh my goodness, praise God. My parents didn't let me, you know, have a car, have a phone, be alone with the opposite sex. They protected me from so much right. and the world says they don't love you. But then I realized they do. And so the verse that I love is Proverbs 8, 13. It says, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And so right mm. there, a lot of times people just look at it. Oh, just love them, yeah. love them. But sometimes we need to show them these intense things because there's a lot of people who have heart in the heart, like Pharaoh, even their, his son died and yet he still mm. goes against yeah. that. So um, yeah, the church powerful. needs to wake up and we know that. But Laura, there's another question, the second one about the church and what yeah, we can I do. I want to ask something about the church. Yeah, and then we so Seth, what do you think about, you were saying how a lot mm -hmm. of churches don't like your message, right? It's their woke churches or they're kind of yeah. politically correct churches. What do you think the percentage is in America? Do you have any guesstimate of how many churches are open to your message and how many are not? Would you say, what do you say the split would be if you had to guess? Yeah, I don't know if I have a good, per a good percentage on how many churches in the country mm -hmm. would allow me to speak. That's kind of a hard one. <laughs> um, but um, I, I saw a study um, recently about the number of churches that had an active pro-life ministry. Mm. Um, and it was a Pew Research Center analysis from 2019 that found that just 4% of sermons shared on U.S. church websites in the spring of 2019 discussed abortion even once. And when they did, it was rarely mentioned repeatedly. Mm. Mm. So Pew Research Center just scanned church websites in mm. the spring of 2019 during that season and saw how many times the word abortion came up in these sermons mm. and found that only 4% of, wow. of sermons had the word abortion come up. And those that did, usually the word abortion was only mentioned once, mm. which means it probably wasn't a sermon on abortion just or the word would have been said more often. Yeah. It was probably just mentioned tangentially. Mm -hmm. Ryan is talking about cultural issues or something like that. I mean, that's a damning critique. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that means that in, in a four to five month period, a four month period, um, just 4% of sermons shared on U.S. church websites even mentioned the word abortion. Mm. So that'd be 96% and this is, of and this church is a, I mean, this is a Holocaust mm. that's happening. And we're, we hardly even say the word yeah. in our sermons. Now, of yeah. course, many churches don't put their sermons on their websites, but I mean, me most do now, yeah. right? Yeah. So that was a pretty large sample size. And I think why that's important, Craig, actually, is because the spring of 2019, that was when they did this, that was right after the winter of 2019, which mm -hmm. go, when does winter end? It goes through February or January, February. Yeah, so sure. what, what was happening in January of 2019? Well, if you recall, New York legalized mm -hmm. abortion through point of birth. Mm -hmm. oh, that's right. And they lit up the tower pink in mm -hmm. oh, New York City to celebrate abortion. It should have been lit up red to represent the blood oh, of unborn yeah. children that Andrew Cuomo oversees and celebrates in his state. And then you had Ralph Northam in Virginia to, uh, with his own Reproductive Health Act, which legalized abortion mm -hmm. through point of birth in Virginia. Mm -hmm. That's partic particularly sick because Ralph Northam mm -hmm. is a former pediatrician. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. So, so much for caring for yeah. children. <laughs> yeah. And he was asked on a radio show in 2019, what would you do in a situation where a child was born alive during mm -hmm. a botched abortion? Mm -hmm. And he said, and I quote, well, I tell you what we'd do. We'd deliver the baby. We'd make the baby comfortable. We'd resuscitate the baby if that's what the mother wanted. Mm. And then the mother and the doctor would have a conversation hmm. yeah. about what, Ralph Northam, you sick freak? Yeah. That's yeah. a child, a born alive infant who's on the hospital mm. table. What is there to have a conversation about except to take care of the baby? Yeah. So he got in hot water for that. So I say all that to say the country was horrified at what was happening in New York under Cuomo and in Virginia under Ralph Northam. And a lot of pastors began preaching sermons on abortion that I hadn't seen do before yeah. because they were so scandalized by these statements. And many pro-life pastors who just confess pro-life ideas but do nothing about it, 
didn't even know that abortion was legal through all nine months of pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Most pastors don't even understand this. And yeah. so when they saw Andrew Cuomo legalize abortion through point of birth in the state of California, they were like, uh, state of New York, they were like, huh? That's yeah. not, you can't do that. <laughs> and I'm like, oh gosh, guys. Yes, you can. I've been trying to tell you. And so I say all that to say that was when this Pew Research uh, study was done wow. was in the season of abortion mania. Oh, so, so if so there high. was a time oh, to man. talk about abortion in the yeah. church, it mm -hmm. would have been following infanticidal huh. approval in New York and Virginia. And they found uh, only 4% of sermons shared on U S church websites in the spring of 2019, even mentioned the word abortion once. And when it did, it was rarely mentioned repeatedly. So that's all I can give you in terms of what so kind of ninety six percent of churches are. Kind of yeah, 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 right, right. Um, and maybe yeah. maybe they talked about it, yeah. you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, earlier, and maybe no, they're not doing enough, but not very much. Yeah. And so that yeah. that just tells me sort of a little bit about um, you know what churches are doing anything. And then and then there was another study done one time. It might have been by a Christian group that found about twelve percent of churches have an active pro life ministry. I think it's less than that. Mm -hmm. That would be very generous. And many churches that do have a pro life ministry, they're not doing a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, anyways, those are some stats on terms of what the church does in America, which is, which is a, you know, a damning critique. And, you know, Francis Schaeffer once said that if, if Christians can't speak out against something as evil as killing a baby, then the world has the right to ask whether Christ is real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good. I mean, and Francis Schaeffer obviously was very prophetic and yeah. a real a cultural prophet too. He was seeing a lot of the decay in our country and where it was going to lead to at a very early stage. But if you care about your witness and the great commission and the gospel, um, you should certainly care about speaking out against abortion because if pagans who hate God don't even see the church speaking out against killing babies in the womb in a location that they once came from yep. <laughs> and that their savior once dwelled in, how could you expect the world to ex uh, respect your credibility yeah. to yeah. even preach that gospel Amen. exactly because your silence on abortion is a form of consent yep. mm -hmm. and, and this is what proverbs 24 11 through 12 says it says hold back those staggering towards slaughter and if you say yeah. we did not know about this god <laughs> proverbs says does not he who made your life know it mm -hmm. yeah. does not he who made your heart see it mm. yeah. And will he not judge man according to what he has done? In other words, if innocent people are being led to the slaughter and you yeah. won't intervene to hold them back and then you justify your apathy by saying, I, did, I didn't know, God. <laughs> God knows that you know Amen. because he sees your heart and you're going to be judged according yeah. to your apathy, according yeah. to your consent in that evil. Amen. Did you ever see the movie? I don't know if it's a pretty intense movie, but we were soldiers. And remember mm. in, the, in the camp, they said, how did you, how did, the soldiers got wow. angry at the town and said, how did, I forget what town it was, but how did you mm. not know it was a death camp right outside? How did you not know? And people said, we didn't know. We didn't, wow. we didn't know what the smoke coming out. I'm going to go rewatch. I think I might watch it years ago, yeah. but now you just inspired wild, me but to yeah, go were yelling, the yeah. A lot of the soldiers were yelling at them, why, how did you let this atrocity happen yeah. five miles or three yeah. miles away or yeah. two they miles from the Well, know. that's the Levite and the priest, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The parable of the Good Samaritan. Yeah. 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 They yeah. knew there was a bleeding victim on the side of the road and they went out of their way to walk by on the Too other busy. side. And I like what you said, like I live, it's kind of neat to see someone, I, I, you know, like a young prophet like yourself with the sense of, you know, I'll be prophet like, ooh, prophet. Mm -hmm. But I mean, to be bold because, you know, I'm I'm kind of an old jerk, so it's kind of neat. I thought you were young. 29. I'm 29. <laughs> yeah, I, just, I, I dyed my hair <laughs> great to be cool. You know? <laughs> but, uh, but it's really cool how Jesus said, you know, woe to you when all men speak well of you like they did the false prophets. Yeah. And isn't that weird how we try to everyone love us or like what we say when Jesus says, you know, if you're going to speak the truth, it's going to offend people that, like you said, have hardened their hearts or yeah. trying to justify blatant sin. And we need to quit worrying about, you know, I shouldn't, I think we, you would say this, that we don't want to purposely offend people, but we should True. not be offended by speaking the truth to Amen. people that are doing horrendous things. We should mm -hmm. be able to say, hey, we love you. That is why we speak the truth. I mean, people have said Absolutely. that to me. Craig, you're this one. We, I was, it's uh, this girl that I know. She was just the sweetest girl ever, but she sleep with her boyfriend blatantly. And everyone knew it. And I so they called her sweet somebody. And I called her smelly somebody. And she got so bad at me. But that saying that to her was because I was saying we all smell all our sin. But I said, well, you crap. need to repent. And that's what turned mm. her life around. So Amen. me being, quote, a jerk 
help turn around. I think yeah. we need to say that same thing about death. Like Amen. Because if you don't have it in front of you, it is easy. Like you said, sadly, it's in the womb. We don't see it. It's in nice yeah. clinical places. And you don't see the body parts getting hauled out. Like you see those pictures you showed. But when you see that, you realize that. And like you deal with it every day going there. Yeah. You just, it's just, it, when I see yeah. that, and they had that That's weird, right. the one in Tucson is that weird goddess lady. Oh, yeah, had this weird goddess right outside it's of the crazy. Planned Parenthood. And you realize, wow, it's kind of like Moloch. And it's like, you just need to, we do need to really get woke in the good sense mm, oh, and speak okay. the truth in love yeah. and stand up, pray, That's right. vote, you know, and, and I make no apology. I mean, you know, we, we, you know, I'm not supposed to, I don't tell people who to vote for it, but say, so how could you vote for a party that is yeah. so That's hardcore? Right. Uh, Thomas you know. Sowell has this great line. He says, when you want to help people, you tell them the truth. Yeah. Mm. And when you want to help yourself, you tell them what they want to hear. Yeah. Yeah. And it's and a difference between so kindness and niceness, nice. right? Nice, like a Mormon, nice, yeah. wants everyone to love them. Yeah. Kind says, I love you so much, I'm going to say the hard yeah. thing to you yeah. in hopes you'll turn around and get yeah. right with God. Amen. Yep. And then do you have so, that question? So, yeah, I have so many questions. <laughs> and But one I, I was going to ask, but then because you got on like more of the churches and the woke <laughs> churches. So this is sort of like a multi-part question. So just bear with me, Seth. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, so... You know, so the first part of this is like, what are the churches doing wrong? And and we hear so much about what the churches are doing wrong. And I've heard you speak on this as well. You know, why is the church so silent on abortion mm -hmm. when they're not silent on things around yeah. LGBTQ, mm -hmm. um, L, you know, BLM? Mm -hmm. right. And, you know, what I find myself when I'm at the sidewalk praying because, you know, you, you can, you pray, there's a lot of things to pray for. Um, a few weeks ago, I found myself praying for the pastors and the priest mm. in our community to be bold enough, to be bold like my pastor Craig, mm -hmm. to say, hey, enough is enough. We need to stand up. And, you know, so what can we do to wake up the church, wake up the pastors and say, you're letting babies die in your own community where we know every day that they're slaughtering babies and we can't get people to come out and protest and right. come out and pray and come out and be bold enough to say something. Yeah. The churches are just, they're, they're yeah. letting, again, they're letting it happen. That's right. They're, they're blind. Like, you know, the people in the community who knew that you were, didn't open their eyes to, yeah. you know, the slaughter of, of millions of, of, of Jewish people. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, when, when you care more about your reputation <laughs> than you do about truth, then you actually don't care about truth. Yeah. yeah. And as soon as you choose the path of least resistance in order to ensure you don't lose any members or <laughs> tithers in your church, yeah. then you actually don't care about truth. Yeah. And I think that's a message we have to communicate to the church because if they cared about truth as the highest good, and it is the highest good, mm -hmm. because who do we follow? The way, the, the truth, truth, and the life. Amen. And scripture actually says in the New Testament, <clears throat> you probably know this verse, it says, Jesus is reality. Mm -hmm. Jesus is reality. He is reality itself. He is truth itself. He is the eternal logic of the universe. He is the logos, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, truth is the highest good. Yep. Yeah. Um, and if you are willing to either not speak truth or intentionally speak lies mm. because you don't want to offend people in your congregation, you don't want to have the appearance of being political, mm. right? Or you don't want to lose any members, then you actually don't care about truth. Yeah. You don't care about it at all. It's not as if you care about it a little bit less than your reputation. You actually don't care about it at all. Mm -hmm. Because if, if you're willing to cave on really the moral outrage of our day, I mean, abortion is the moral issue of our day. Amen. That doesn't mean there's not other issues. Of course there are. Do you think that there weren't other injustices happening in, in 1850s America? Mm. No, of course, there was sex trafficking going on in 1850s America. Mm, right. There was spousal abuse happening in mm. 1850s America. Women didn't have full equal voting rights in 1850. There were mm. plenty of bad things yeah. happening in 1850. But what do most people think of when they think of 1850s America? Slavery. Slavery. Yeah. I mean, that was yeah, the yeah. issue of its day. So while many issues are important, yeah. they don't all carry the same moral weight. Yeah. Yeah. While many issues are important today, 
abortion carries the greatest moral weight because it actually denies the founding principles of our republic, mm -hmm. which is that we hold these truths to be self-evident. We have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Mm -hmm. And so for pastors who can't even engage on the life issue, on abortion mm -hmm. itself, on the mm -hmm. killing of children in a womb designed to hold them and from which that pastor safely traveled, <laughs> then I actually don't trust them on any other yeah. issue. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, how do we wake up the pastors and churches on this issue who allow it in their community? Because if you know the right thing to do, but yeah. fail to do it, it's then sin. for you, it is sin. Amen. How the heck do we wake these people up? I mean, the pro-life movement has been trying to wake up the church for 48 years. Yeah. Protestants and Catholics working together have been pleading with pastors to wake up mm -hmm. and nothing. Nothing, right? I mean, that's why individuals are so blessed and encouraged when they attend a church like this or when mm -hmm. they attend Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills. Why are they so encouraged? Because there's not a lot out there. Because yeah. there's not, there's not the you know, slim pickings, yeah. right? In terms of, of, of uh, yeah. pastors with spines. And most pastors yeah. do have spines, but they're made of rubber. Yeah. And so they Even invert themselves <laughs> into political yeah. and theological yeah. pretzels yeah. Yeah. in order to event offending anyone. But like, we, like I just said, what like Thomas Sowell said, when you... When you love someone, when you want to help someone, you tell them the truth. And mm -hmm. when you want to help yourself, you tell them what they want to hear. Yeah. So most pastors are in the business of helping themselves and their bottom line yep. um, rather than the the sheep that they're supposed to be protecting. Mm -hmm. And who is a more vulnerable sheep than an unborn one mm -hmm. um, who can't protect themselves? So my... My belief is that after you plead with pastors to wake up and engage, after you go out of your way to be gracious and yeah. loving and say, Pastor so-and-so, this is the ministry I have. Will you work with us? Can we? Can you just give me a table in the mm -hmm. foyer after church? I'm not even asking <laughs> to be able to speak. Can I just like engage with your people? Hey, can you green light a pro-life ministry that all run at Amen. the church? Can you just green light it and talk about it from the pulpit? I, you don't have to give me the speaking opportunity. Just like, can you talk about it and let people know what we're doing? Um, can you preach against it on Sanctity of Human Life Sunday? Mm -hmm. Can you ask people to sign up for sidewalk counselors to stand outside the doors of death and we'll do the training with them to save these babies? If you go out of your way to do this and these pastors continue to say no to you and shut you down over yeah. and over and over again... My belief at that point is, is that now you're fully justified in, <laughs> in taking the Bonhoeffer approach and saying you're not confessing the real Christ. Amen. Because that's why Bonhoeffer called themselves a confessing church, was yeah. to say we're actually confessing real Christianity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the rest of you who are, who are silent on the genocide of the Jews or you're condoning it from your pulpits, you've actually created a Christ in your own image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I actually at that point support... Um, kind of taking the Pauline approach, which is to say as a brother sins against you, you take it to him. If he doesn't mm -hmm. listen, you bring two others. If he doesn't listen, you take it before the church. church. If he doesn't repent, you treat him as a pagan and a tax, tax collector. collector. Yep. Now, obviously I know someone might say, Seth, you got your, you got your hermeneutic wrong there. That was about, that was about <laughs> brothers sinning against one another yeah. conflict re resolution. Okay, sure. Maybe it's not exactly the same, but if one knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, then yep. for you to sin. So that is a form of sin and you're mm -hmm. condoning abortion through your silence. Your silence is deafeningly loud. Um, and and so now if, you, if you're going to condone that through your apathy, then, then you're complicit in it. Um, then I would, and again, you know, people are going to hate this. Then I think you hold aborted <laughs> baby photo signs outside of their church. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. That's now, nice. now people are going, okay, Seth, I hate you now. <laughs> you're never going to speak in my church. But then, you know, I just, I like to challenge people to just like to apply the beliefs that they hold on abortion and apply it to infanticide mm -hmm. or the killing of toddlers. Yeah. I like to ask pastors to do that because then I want to test to see if they're consistent. Mm -hmm. Because if the unborn is fully human, here's the thing, then they have just as much dignity and rights as the infant, the mm -hmm. one-year-old, and the two-year-old. Because our human rights flow from a human nature, not from our functions and capacities. Mm -hmm. So if our right to life flows from a human nature, then the question becomes, when do we get a human nature? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, when we become human. Mm -hmm. And when do we become human? The moment mm -hmm. of conception. Gotcha. So if the child in the womb is has full dignity and rights as any born person from the moment of conception, then it's only, it's only reasonable to say that they deserve the same protection in our laws. Mm -hmm. So if they deserve the same protection in our laws, I like to ask pastors who won't do anything or very little on abortion, if they would take the same approach, if Planned Parenthood opened an infanticidal arm of their business mm. with the legalization of that practice and our tax dollars funding it. What if Planned Parenthood started killing infants up to one years old mm. and our Congress 
and president legalized it at a federal level or through executive action or whatever, right? Just legal, let's just say they legalize infanticide, right? It's okay. You can kill babies through one year old, fulfilling Peter Singer's dream, the, the de- immoral, bankrupt philosopher at Princeton University who defends abortion through point of birth and infanticide. Um, okay, Pastor, now here's my question to you. Infanticide is now legal in your community. There are two facilities in your city that perform abortions through point of birth, and they will kill your infant as long as that infant is under 365 days outside of the womb. Mm. Um, and you fund it with your tax dollars. Mm. So here's my question for you, Pastor. Um, what 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 do you think we should do about that? <laughs> um, do you think we should you should preach an anti-infanticide sermon once a year? Or do you think, what would you do? I'm just curious. And if if any pastor is honest, he's usually not with me because he doesn't want to grant my premise. Because if he grants the premise, then he <laughs> has to admit that he has the same responsibility to the pre-born yeah. as he does to the born. Yeah. So most pastors that I've challenged with this, I've done on social media. And so they, 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 they won't actually engage with me. But <laughs> I think if they're honest, and I think you and every listener on the show would agree, mm. every pastor, if he's honest, would say, yeah, our church would be would be um, protesting in the streets. Mm-hmm. We'd be marching, and we'd be we'd yeah. we'd probably create human blockades, um, arm mm. in arm outside of these centers, mm-hmm. and try to stop women from taking their one year olds in. Yeah. yeah, maybe we even try to pull the one year old out of her yeah, arms and run, run away, away with yeah. it. Because yeah. exactly. you can't do the same thing on abortion, right? Mm-hmm. You can't like cut open her, her yeah. you know, womb and take it out. Mm-hmm. But I'm saying I'm applying a moral premise, exactly. a moral premise in, in this thought experiment to see how people would respond. So whatever the pastor's response would be on the legalization of the killing of one year olds, it's not the same on abortion. We obviously know that. Mm-hmm. And so what he's done is he's actually granted a premise to the to the high priests of secular progressivism, um, which is that these children are not fully human and they Mm. don't deserve the same dignity. Because if you believe they did, Pastor, you would require the same protections for them as you do for infants. Mm -hmm. And so then I'd say, um, what if a pastor said, yeah, we don't, that, you know, infanticide, guys, that's a political issue. Mm. Mm. You know, killing of infants, that's a political issue. Uh, and so we don't talk about that at our church. You know, but if you want to go stand outside of <laughs> clinics that kill one-year-olds, um, you should totally do that. But mm. we don't do that at our church. We don't talk about that. And we're definitely not going to tell people that it's a moral wrong to vote for the Democratic Party, the party of infanticide. We're definitely never going to say that because, you know, we don't want to compromise our witness. So you go do that, but we won't. Then my question would be, do you think it would be wrong, Christian, pastor, to hold photos of the one-year-olds whose bodies we found in the trash can Mm. behind Planned Mm. Parenthood after they were killed and hold photos of those children outside of his office when Mm. he comes in to prep his sermon Saturday night Mm. or hold them outside of his church on Sunday with the words, um, uh, Pastor Tom supports this. Mm. (laughs) And I think most people, they might get uncomfortable that I would say that, but I think I could get most Christians, just normal conservative Christians, right, who are who who are just kind of like pro-life by attitude but don't do anything about it. I think I could get most pro-life Fired Christians up. to say totally. Mm-hmm. I, I think you're right, yeah. Seth. I think mm-hmm. if a pastor ki- condones the killing of one-year-olds in his community and, and actually looks you in the face and says, you can't launch an anti-infanticidal ministry at our church and I won't tell people to do anything to stop it, I think most Christians would say, yeah, I would actually stand with you, Seth, on that church on Sunday morning on the sidewalks as people drive in with photos of murdered infants so that those congregants know that their pastor supports the killing of one-year-olds. So assuming everything I said is true and that someone would support that in my infanticidal thought experiment, why wouldn't they support the same action on abortion? Yeah, Mm. that's good. And if they don't, do you know what that actually tells me? You don't believe the unborn child is intrinsically valuable enough to warrant political protection. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I also think it's sad because that's what Satan loves to do. He loves to hide things, he likes to put in the darkness. And so exactly. that's, we know he's disguised himself as an angel of light. So he loves that it's not being talked about, like you were saying. He loves it when we don't show the pictures, we don't do all that stuff. But Laura, you had a question yeah, I about. Say real quick, I gotta say something. Yes, exactly. But I like what Charlie said when he was here, Charlie Kirk. Mm-hmm. He said, if you go to your mm-hmm. pastor, you say, hey, we wanna get involved. Yeah. They say, we don't do that. He says, then you should go find a church that does support pro life. And you should say, and we should vote with our feet. Like you said, if we start Amen. 
uh, speaking out enough, voting, people eventually come around, right? You get, like they said, it only takes like a couple hundred phone calls or emails for a senator to go, whoa, this is kind of important and we need to do that yeah. and put the pressure. Like you said, they're loud, but we tend to be, oh, we're Christians. Right. We can't fight. We the can't left say, does that really you know, well. Yeah. I mean, they mm-hmm. get that social grassroots effort out yeah. there yep. to get people to call, to, to demand action. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, what if Christians we'll in, burn in, the city in, down. in our <laughs> communities yeah. and cities yeah. started calling these pastors yeah. all day? Yeah. Yeah. What if he couldn't, what if he <laughs> couldn't finish banks. his sermon prep yeah. because he was getting calls from faithful Christians in his yeah. county? Like every time he goes back to prep his sermon mm. saying like, you don't speak on pro You won't even allow the 40 days for life yeah. coordinator to partner with your church to get yeah. people out to save children. Mm. What kind of church are you? Yeah. What kind of pastor are mm. you? Can you imagine how a pastor would be? Okay. I have to do something right. just for selfish reasons yeah. because I don't want to be perceived as I'm going to lose the people the I'm trying to save. prayer would be that that would lead him to real repentance, yeah. that he wouldn't just be changing yeah. out of response to demands for action, but he would be doing so because God would actually break his heart. It's a good yeah. idea. Our youth, youth group kids love to prank call so they can just start calling. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a good ministry. I'll start anyway. that up. Yeah, I just yeah. want to touch. Pro-life pranking. <laughs> no, no, no. Step in there real oh, quick bastard. about, again, the, um, the, churches, the the priest and pastors not stepping up. When I first got involved with 40 days and stepped up and said, okay, I can help lead this. Um, I had a co-leader who was Catholic and he, and he was going to be leading through the Catholic church and I was going to hit the non-Catholic churches. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we were like, okay, let's make a list of all the churches that we need to approach and say, Hey, we're going to do this and we're going to bring 40 days for life back to our community. And we were told we had to get a certain list, um, that had a listing of all the Catholic churches and half of them, we were not allowed to approach because Mm -hmm. they would not be open and they would basically throw us out on our ears. And I was shocked because I've always, you know, seeing the Catholic church is extremely pro-life and to find out about half of the ones in our community, um, would never allow, um, well, they probably wouldn't allow me in the door since I'm not Catholic, but even our Catholic, Mm -hmm. um, you know, co-leader, it allow him in the door to promote this. And I was shocked. And then, and then to realize, well, we have obviously probably that many, if not more evangelical churches, Protestant churches Mm -hmm. that would also not be welcoming to me coming in. And I love the idea of getting a group of, of, um, faithful volunteers yeah. out there with those signs saying mm-hmm. your pastor supports mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. killing of babies. Yeah. And that is so frightening. That's right. Mm-hmm. It is so frightening. I know the very first time I went to the sidewalk to pray, I was shaken in my mm-hmm. boots and I was so frightened. And I realized that, you know, God just protected me and everything was good. And, yeah. and I've been bl- so blessed from that experience, but I don't know, standing out on the street corner, at, especially some of the previous churches I've attended. Right. Ooh, that, yeah. you know, but, you know, we have to be bold yeah. if we're going yeah. to help save right. babies' lives. Um, but I do have I do have another question for you, of course, I do. Um, and it's really about our tax dollars. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, and I just saw something just recently because, you know, obviously I, I everything about, about um, ending abortion, saving babies' lives, I'm just like immersed in that online and, you know, watching all the podcasts and all that. Right. Um, but basically, is there... It really, is there anything at all that pro-lifers can do? And I know, I sort of know the answer to this, but I have to ask anyway. I don't want my tax dollars going to pay for abortion. Right. And, you know, it's like other than just totally defecting from yeah. the government and telling my employer, you can't take my taxes out of my check anymore <laughs> because I don't want them to go to, pro, to, to, um, to pro-abortion programming and all of that. Yeah. As we know that, um, you know, just again, just Planned Parenthood alone, uh, you know, based on their most recent annual report, 38% of their total revenue came from government funding, which we yeah. know that's, even though they say they're not using it for abortion, we know how, how those f- things function. Yeah. You know, so what, is there anything we can do from the pro-life perspective yeah. to say, you can't use my tax dollars mm-hmm. to pay to kill babies? Yeah. Yeah, obtain political power and wield it. Mm-hmm. Amen, amen. Mm-hmm. So the, the Republicans <laughs> and the GOP has been, I mean, I have a lot I could say about the GOP. <laughs> Obviously, I'm a Republican, but, mm-hmm. um, you know, that doesn't mean that 
there's not a lot of reform that mm-hmm. needs to happen in, in mm-hmm. the Jupy. And here's here's the number one thing, um, and it's actually the same truth, the same critique I have with the church. Right, the left will more passionately do for evil. Um, what we will seemingly not do for good. Mm. And the same thing is true politically. The Democratic Party will more passionately and consistently do for evil what the GOP seemingly can't do for good. Mm -hmm. And we've got this, this frankly, stupid um, sort of libertarian idea in the GOP that just says, you know, to each his own, right? And if we wield political power um, to try to defund Planned Parenthood, or if we wield political power when we have it to say that you can't castrate children either literally or with chemically in uh, castration, castrating drugs because Mm. Timmy played with a doll one time and thinks that he's Sally. Mm. Now, if we pass laws against that, you know, then the Democrats might say you can't go to church Mm. and they'll wield political power and say, Mm. you can't go to church. Yeah. They're already saying that they've been saying that for the last 14 months. Mm -hmm. And we need to abandon the silly idea that anytime you wield political power, that you're just as bad as the Democrats because yeah. they wield political power to advance their agenda all the time. Yes, exactly. But well, they're doing it to where there will be is one both, party. Politics mm-hmm. is is both um, yeah. form and substance, mm-hmm. right? There is a substance to the politics of the GOP, and there's a mm-hmm. substance to the politics of the Democratic Party, and that substance is very different. Mm-hmm. Not that you know. Um, not that the GOP is perfect by any means, but our ideas are much better no. than no. the ideas of the Democratic Party because the primary idea of the Democratic Party is that the right to life is a fictional myth and you mm-hmm. can tuck it away with the tooth fairy and you can be murdered if you're in the womb. Well, that's a really bad idea. <laughs> and and shocker, it's the same idea they believed in the 1850s. <laughs> right? They're just applying it to a new class of victims. And so we have to obtain political power and then we have to wield it effectively when we have it. And unfortunately you saw the GOP not do this in the first two years of Trump's administration when we had the house and the Senate and we didn't even defund Planned Parenthood. Mm. We didn't do it. Right. And we had all three branches and we didn't do it. We couldn't even defund Planned Parenthood. What? That's not even like, mm-hmm. that's not even like a, making it illegal. That's just saying, you know, any organization that kills children shouldn't receive tax dollars. And then Democrats say, yeah, but the Hyde Amendment, the Hyde Amendment, right? It keeps your federal dollars mm-hmm. from funding abortions. Um, specifically, specifically putting it in an abortion uh, budget. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, but money's fungible. Mm-hmm. Money's fungible. Yeah. So Planned Parenthood, I believe last year, got over 600,000 mm. federal dollars. Wow. Over 600 grand, right? But then they say, just earmark it for not abortions, okay? Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, yeah. dude. Yeah, like, right. if, if, if Craig wants <laughs> an Xbox, you know, and a uh, digital camera, but he only you only have 200 bucks, and then I give you 200 bucks, and now you have 400 bucks, which 200 did you spend on the digital camera? Mm-hmm. I don't know. I freed you up to get both, right? It's like, right. what? So we yeah. get Planned Parenthood all this cash from our tax dollars, and then we yeah. tell them, but yeah. don't use it for yeah. abortions, like okay? Like, well, what? Yeah. Yeah. And so it's we are funding them through our tax dollars. The Hyde Amendment just says that federal dollars can't be used directly um, mm-hmm. to for abortions uh, reimbursed through Medicaid, right? Um, by the way, the Bi- Biden and, and Harris, they promised to overturn the Hyde Amendment mm-hmm. while they were running for office, mm-hmm. and now they're pushing to do that, mm-hmm. right? So it, so it's just ridiculous that our tax dollars mm-hmm. are used on, on, on abortions. Here's the thing, though. For anyone who's like, I can't have anything to do with this, right? Mm-hmm. I say, yeah, good luck. Yeah. Good luck. Because if, if you don't want to do anything with your money that helps abortion— I have bad news for you guys. You can't really shop anywhere. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you know this. Exactly. But yeah, don't yeah, go everyone. to Starbucks anymore. Yeah. No more yeah. Target. No yeah. more flying on Delta or Southwest. No more McDonald's. Uh, I mean, I could just go down yeah. the line here. I mean, yeah. you yeah. basically can't shop anywhere. Like Home Depot. Say goodbye to Amazon. Mm-hmm. Say goodbye to Whole Foods. Mm-hmm. You know, I, it's like <laughs> it, it, mm-hmm. they uh, s- these major corporations all give to Planned Parenthood. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you do? Become a political hack obtain political power and wield it effectively when you have it. And if Christians who believe that our God was a fetus um, can't 
wield political power and use it in a way to protect unborn image bearers, then who else will? Mm. If anyone had the theological undergirding mm. to become involved in politics to protect the vulnerable, it ought to be Christians yeah. because we say we worship an unborn child. So if we can't do that, I mean, who will do it, right? And this is why I believe that abortion won't end until the church decides it's time to end it. Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us for our part one conversation with Seth Gruber. Please make sure to join us next week for part two. If you haven't already, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share this video. If you'd like to listen to us wherever you get your podcast, just type in Calvary Conversations. Also, make sure to follow us on Instagram at Calvary Conversations. Thanks so much to our sponsors, Mission Heating and Cooling. Please check out their website in the description below. Also, make sure to check out next week's part two with Seth Gruber. Thanks so much, guys, and God bless. Amen.